people. Praise the Lord, everyone. Uh, this is another hour um, that Myra and I get to enjoy spending time with you all sharing the Word of God and just sharing other things that may come up in the um, course of our conversation. So now there's a challenge that's going on in my household. The challenge is this. We understand that today is a Super Bowl Sunday, and we know that the attention spans may be a little different today, and I also am sensitive to that, and um, I had to tell Myra, because I'm the main culprit of this, um, I'm not going to go long today. Um, we're going to actually get started momentarily, and we are going to finish this before 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Love you, Naomi. Love you, Jackie. Praise God. So, what I'm going to do just very briefly is just set up what we're doing now. Oh, you know what, see, now this is bad. When your own child, the one who is supposed to be the one in your life, tells you that you're long-winded, Pop, what do you do with that? Tell the truth. <laughs> Amen. So look, real quick, um, this uh, lesson today, which is in Galatians 5, uh, verse 1, uh, was submitted by Denise Morgan. Denise, Denise Morgan is a very, very good friend of ours. So good that we almost at least spend at least uh, one opportunity each year to, to hang out together, if nothing else, at the missions conference. Uh, but Denise has also been one that has gone out um, and done outreach with us and with me in particular, and we've actually walked the streets of Baltimore and uh, shared the word of God. So this is her submission today. So I'm going to shut up and I'm going to turn this over to Myra. Myra normally goes about 20, 25 minutes. I'm going to actually try to do the same, which will get you guys out of here before the national anthem of the game. So Myra, it's all yours. Bless the Lord, all my soul. Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for all that this day has brought and all that this day has blessed us with and all that this day has shown us more about you. We bless you, Lord. We thank you. We honor you. We praise you. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. 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 Now, Galatians 5.1, it says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Now he's talking to, oh, I'm sorry, Paul is talking to a group of people in Galatia who have accepted Christ, and of course, some of them were Jews and some of them were non-believers, just heathens. But they have been influenced by other people's words and they're not really walking in the same things that they used to, and they're into bondage. And the bondage is basically disputing over things. And in this instance, it's circumcision. And that, you know, that was the Jewish uh, tradition. And now, you know, most young children are circumcised right away. But it was a Jewish tradition that God had given them in uh, their travels when they had to go through the desert. And it's, it's very hygienic. It's, it's proven that way. So, you know, whatever God gives us is, is good. But now it's become something like a ritual. So if you're not circumcised, then there's something against you. So they're saying the people who come in who are not Jewish, who come and believe in Christ, if they weren't Jewish, they aren't circumcised, so they need to be circumcised. And Paul is saying, you're going back to bondage. Because that's not what Christ came to do. That was a tradition. It wasn't something that was, you know, 
made a set, set in stone that had anything to do with your heart, your faith. It was just something God had done for them, for the Jewish people, as they were going through um, the desert. And even in the um, same book and chapter 5, 13, it says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. I mean, it was, it was becoming very contentious between them. If you're not, you know, you're not circumcised, then, you know, you, sh you should be, and maybe your rank shouldn't be that high in the gathering or the church, as they called it. And that's, that's not God. That's not about God. They were opportunity for the flesh. It's the flesh. This rising up and saying, I'm all about this. And as we were starting today, and I was trying to think of something that, will be relevant today. And I don't know why, but the Lord said to me, ordination. And I thought, <laughs> oh, that's interesting. <laughs> because if you read the Bible, there was no ordination. Even Jesus says that we're called. And he says that I have ordained you. We're not ordained by man. We've been ordained by God to fulfill the work of Christ. And I mean, I remember, and I found this little card, it's, it's all ripped up, that I had gotten back in 1986. And it said I was set apart to the diaconate of the church. And it used that same scripture, John 13, 16. It said, you did not choose me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatever whatsoever you ask of the Father in my name he may give to you. What does that say about being a pastor or, or anything? That's tradition. We have set it up so that we do certain things, and I say we because we are the people of God. I remember reading, as I, I love history, that <laughs> years ago, like in the 1700s in America, because in England they had their own form form of doing things, uh, and I know more about the United States than England. But I mean, a lot of the you know the people that came over were Christians. But at at one time there was they were buildings. But they were also circuit riders who would just go from town to town and the people would gather together to hear the word. And some of these people were very famous because there was a fruit that came out. People got saved, people got converted, people changed their, their lives because of the anointing over that person who was called and chosen by God. Didn't have a building, he had the call. And we, we are, you know, pretty caught up in a building. And that's and this is almost synonymous with what the Jews were going through. Because they were caught up in the tradition of, we got to do this. We have to do this this way. And there's no formula. There's a temple. Well, that's the temple of God. And that's in heaven. And there's one that they're building in Jerusalem. They built over and over again. It's been destroyed so many times. But those are symbolic because we are the temple of God. It says that. That's scriptural. We are the temple of God. Does not mean we don't gather. We, we definitely gather because we have something to say. We have something to share. It says in John 8.32, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. It didn't say if you, uh, you build a building and you establish a group of people, you are my disciples. No, it says if you abide in my word and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And there's got to be a freedom in this, this church uh, relationship we have. We're watching a whole lot of things on television. They're talking about the black church. They're talking about all these different things and churches that are happening and all these scandals. And it's like, but what about God? Because the, the circumstances are all about 
a man who said he was called by God, who fell, and a whole lot of other people fell with him. And it says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entitled again with the yoke of bondage. That's bondage. I know of people who have left a church because of the leadership. And that's sad because the leadership is supposed to be there to show us God. And then we're supposed to go out and be, we're discipled in the church or in, the, in, a, in a gathering of people. And then we go out. But we feel that this man that is standing in the pulpit is almost godlike. Because it's expressed that way. My pastor. Oh, you should have heard what my pastor said. And I'm not trying to make fun of anyone. But we, is us, as believers, we have taken our focus off of God. And we're placing it on people. And we just saw an <laughs> array of lights. Of like, did I say something special? <laughs> that was interesting. And we shouldn't do that because everyone has a place and a calling. And the leadership has that calling. But it's to lead to, to the Lord, not to lead to us to be that voice that tells you in some instances whether you should marry somebody, what you should do with your money, how you should live your life. The word of God coming from that particular person should be leading us to be disciples, to be followers of Jesus Christ. I know in, in 1 Corinthians 7, 19, they're talking about the circumcision, but let's say as we talk about being chosen and we talk about being ordained, let's, I'm going to put that word in and see what happens. Ordination is nothing. But keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Oh, did I say that? Oh, that's interesting. Let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Do not be concerned about it. But if you could be made free, rather use it. Because sometimes we are slaves to our pastors. We shouldn't be. We should be slaves to Christ. But he who is called in the Lord, while a slave, is the Lord's freedom. So we can go to a church and get free. Hmm. Be <clears throat> free. And to understand that we're there to hear about God. And this is likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. And I tried to figure that out, but the first thing that came to my mind was, when we think we're free, we're not. So we have to be under him to get to understand, to be a slave to Christ, not a slave to a man, not a slave to a building, not a slave to a group, but a slave to Christ, that we, we can learn to be free. So, even in, in all that, 1 Peter 2 says, we still have to submit ourselves to the ordinance of man for the Lord's sake whether to the king as supreme or to governors, as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers. Because we set this up, and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. We have to infiltrate the government by doing good. I remember uh, Paul McArthur, and I don't even know a lot about him, but recently we would listening to some of his teaching. And he... I think you mean John McArthur? Oh, did I say Paul? Yeah, John oh, McArthur. John McArthur. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. John McArthur. And he, he was talking about civil disobedience. And he said, we're not called to civil disobedience. The Bible says we are to obey those in authority. And that's what First Peter 2 says. For this is the will of God. By doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. As free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bond servants of God. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. We're not doing that. 
as Christians. They are things that are specifically written out in the New Testament. And they are things in the Old Testament that become embellished because of who Christ is. He takes an ordinance from the Old Testament and brings it to life because of his sacrifice. We are not caught up in the old and the, the, the limits of what the Jews had to live by. But it's been amplified because of Christ. And it becomes alive and it becomes a living part of who we are. Especially when it says John 16, 13. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. Things are common, people. I am not against the church. I love going to church. I love sitting and, and hearing the word. I love singing the songs, most of them. Um, as long as it points to the Lord and it praises him. But we are caught up in a, in a, in a vice that if we don't go to church into a building, that we're not Christians. It says a gathering because... I, I really believe as much as people rail against the pandemic, I think it was God's way of showing us the future. Because we have been to countries where there's no building, but there's a gathering of people who come together to hear the word. There's, there's no particular outline. There's no particular... We're going to sing a song, and then we're going to do this. We're going to say a prayer. We're going to have this. It's the word. And that's what they came to hear. And it's not about the way we structure things. It's about being hungry for the word and, and depending upon it, not having to wait a half an hour for the word to come up. Because that one day, it will be like that for us. Because we're, we're full. We, we've got everything. But we're not going to have all those creature comforts one day. It's, it's in the Word. We're going to be persecuted. We're a little persecuted now. But not like we're going to be persecuted in the future. And not like people are being persecuted in other countries. Like my husband is dealing with a group of people in Pakistan. And they're sending them Bibles. But, and then he does videos, which amazes me. But when the people hold up their Bibles, they do like this. Because they don't want their faces to be recorded. And I remember years ago, I went to communist China smuggling in Bibles. And, and met people who had been put in concentration camps to re be re-educated. You know, it was the first time I'd ever been somewhere we could die for being a Christian. We need the church, the ecclesia, needs to realize that what we have built, what we have structured, what man has done in our flesh is not glorifying God. Because it's not the word that's going for this is fame and and this is my church and these mm. are my people and that's my pastor. Jesus, he died. And he said, On this rock I will Build my church. Okay. That's, he said that to Peter. But Peter's just an example. No, Peter saw the Christ. Paul saw the Christ. And Paul says, follow me, you know, as I have heard from him. They have no man in this day and age to say, follow me. He should never say that. He should say, follow Christ. Because he's just a spokesman. Because people need to hear the word. When I was in school, we had Bible. We heard it every morning through the intercom. There was a scripture. There was prayer. But there's a generation who's never heard the word, except in a in a in a curse word or or something that was very uh, malicious. So they are people who need to hear the word, and we are the church. And outside of that building is where. It needs to be heard. There's nothing wrong with going to church. But don't glorify the building. Glorify God in it. 
because the, the reputation of the church of Jesus Christ is is bad. It's really bad because people are putting people on pedestals. So we have liberty, stand fast in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. So as someone says, I'm getting together with people and I'm going to be praying with them, and you say, oh, how can you do that? You you have to be in the building, you have to have this passion, you have to have this covering. I, I looked high and low, I don't see anything in the Bible about a covering. Christ is our covering. God is the head, the man is next, and then he covers the wife. That's the only thing I saw about covering. And then we cover our children and, and, and nurture them. But that comes from God. God is the head. We have put language in this vernacular of the church that is not necessarily pleasing to the Lord. And it's choking us. Because we're not glorifying God. We're glorifying our flesh. Because someone comes with another word, and they do another season, I'm going to throw up. This is my season. Really? When you got saved, that was your season. Because the salvation is the beginning. So you're going to have to wait 10 years to have your season? Think about the terminology that we're using. It's all flesh. It's not about God. It's not about Him. That's why it says stand fast. Not only does it say it in Galatians, it says it in 1 Corinthians. Why? Because we are so easily influenced by things that look good and talk good and, and come up with catchy, catchy phrases. I, I admit I am not as eloquent as my husband. Mm. But my husband is not my God. Mm -hmm. If he says something, I'm like, Woo, wait a minute. And we have that freedom. If I say something, he goes, wait a minute. He has that freedom to say something to me. And I have that freedom to say something to him. If I hear something, I feel that the word is not exactly right. But I respect him and I love him. But he's not my God. God is my God. I mean, God loved us so much that he sacrificed his only begotten son for us. And then we want to make it our religion. We want to make it our church. We want to make it our, it's, everything belongs to him. And if we really honored him, the church of Jesus Christ, and I'm not talking about the Mormons, <laughs> the church of Jesus Christ <laughs> would reflect <laughs> him. People would not be leaving those places. They would be rushing to hear the word, to go back out and disciple somebody else. Are we doing that? Do you see that? No. We see more criticism, justifiably criticism. Because some of the things that are happening in some of our churches is really abominable. And we thank God for those churches that really stand firm in the things of God and teach the people that they can go out and teach somebody else, that they will go and teach somebody else. But you don't hear about those churches because the enemy doesn't want that to be spoken about. He loves what's happening in the news. He loves all the controversy about the people of God because we have allowed our flesh to have dominance over us and the liberty. We're free thinkers, but we should be free thinkers for Christ not free thinkers for our flesh. We have liberty in Christ, but the liberty that we have in our flesh has no value. So think on those things and think on the Lord and ask Him, what am I doing every Sunday morning and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday? We, we say Sunday is the Lord's Day and we respect that because that represents the day of rest, but we did that. Every day is the Lord's day. Every day is the time of worship. Every day is the time to seek Him. Every day, mm -hmm. not just on Sunday. In whatever form of fashion God has led you, follow that. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free.
Mm. And do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Amen. One thing I do want to say just up front, because we, we talk about this um, issue called church, and I, I'm going to be frank with you. I, I wish we could get out of the habit of saying I'm going to church, because we... All of us, the body of believers, are the embodiment of the holy church that, that Christ has established. And so I, I can't go to something that I already am. So when, you know, when we are going to whatever different locations, because it could be a building, it could be a tent, it could be under a tree. Believe me, we've done all of those things. But... Keep in mind, it is just what that word um, ecclesia that um, um, Myra talked about earlier, that simply means assembly or gathering. So let's start changing our vernacular that way because once we start talking about going to church, then we're going to be talking about a specific uh, building probably and probably a specific person, but I believe what we're having right here, right on Facebook Live, is church, because we're believers, and we're praying that you all are believers, and so together, this is a gathering. It might be a virtual one, but a gathering nevertheless. With that said, let's get into this, because I was so glad that Myra covered basically this whole issue of freedom, and she talked about it from that very aspect of being free, to be released from something, to to live in liberty, and in this case, the liberty of Christ. And what I'm going to do is talk about that freedom as well, but I have to keep it contextual with what was actually going on in the book of Galatians. So, so that I'm not long-winded, as my daughter has accused me of. So, when I look at Galatians uh, chapter 5, I always read the entire book, and in fact, the entire book, entire chapters. I, I normally read those things because it helps me to understand the context of what's being said. And you know what, Myra? Here's the funny thing. Um, I always tease Myra because she's always trying to find out who done it uh, without going through the process of watching the movie. And yeah, so so in Myra's world, and yes, I'm talking about my baby, but in Myra's world, she don't care if she knows the outcome. Okay, but I do. Uh, because I, I need to like go through that whole process to finally get to the promised land because that's the way the writers write this stuff. Nevertheless, uh, Paul, who wrote this book uh, for the Galatians, um, you know, in chapter 5, Paul just, he goes right to the, the bottom line. So let, let me read this for you because he says, and I'm reading from the e English standard version. He says, for freedom, Christ has set us uh, wait a minute. Yeah, I'm sorry. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. So in actuality, he's already given us the bottom line as the first sentence of this particular uh, chapter. So, you know me, I had to go through, I had to read everything. So, if you guys are taking notes, because uh, I'm not going to read through all of these verses, but here are the things that we want to pull out of this. In Galatians 5, 1 through 12, uh, we're talking about freedom from the law through Christ. Freedom from the law through Christ. In other words, I heard Myra kind of bring it up. This is a, a thing of this transition from Old Covenant to the New Covenant in Christ. So that's the first one. Then the second point is freedom by loving and serving your neighbors in the Spirit. 
Okay, that's Galatians 5, 13 through 15. And these things are important because when we're talking about freedom, we want to understand what the writer was talking about because there's a specific people, and I'm going to talk about them in a moment, that he was actually addressing. And this was a stressful time. I'm going to let you guys know that there's nothing that we're going through now that the early church, and that's the early assembly of people, they were, they were going through a lot of persecution and uh, different interpretations of what this so-called freedom really means. So in the first one, again, freedom from the law through Christ. Second one, freedom by loving and serving your neighbors in the spirit. That's capital S, the Holy Spirit. The third point we want to pull out is freedom by denying the wickedness of the flesh through that same Holy Spirit, which is uh, in Galatians 5, verses 16 through 21. And then lastly, uh, freedom by way of of the fruit of the Spirit to avoid the penalty of sin. And that's Galatians 5, 22 through 26, and that ends the chapter. So the writer, who is Paul, he gives us the summation in verse 1, and then after that, he actually fleshes out what this all means. Because, yeah, when I look at freedom, we, we have different kind of freedoms. It could be freedom from a, a, a wicked employer. It could be freedom from, you know, uh, pressure and depression. There, there are many aspects to this word freedom. But contextually, we're dealing in the areas that I just brought up. And now to get into who Paul was actually writing to. So he is writing to Jewish believers and Gentile believers throughout Galatia. All right? Because, again, there was some things going on mainly by a group that's called the Judaizers. And when you ever see the Judaizers, that's just a fancy way of saying this is a group of people who thought that, hey, um, it's all right to, you know, believe in this Jesus Christ, but we still believe that you guys want to be uh, or ought to be circumcised under the old covenant law. So they they were they were still trying to bring the old covenant as a, a, maybe a, a, a linchpin to a whole new situation that's called Christianity as we know it. And so there were those that were basically with the thought processes. Oh, if we uh, get circumcised. I'm talking about physical circumcised. Hey, for you all that don't know what that means, that means that that's that uh, foreskin that is cut away from the male child, normally uh, early after birth. All right, so that there's a cutting away of the flesh, which is symbolic. All right, and and we understand why in the old covenant, which by the way was the old covenant for the Jews. We Gentiles were never under that covenant, although some of our leadership to this very day keeps trying to put us back in, just like the Judaizers. The Judaizers were doing the same thing. Okay, you can have this new thing called Christ, but at the same time, you, we, we still want you to be obedient to God. They, they were literally separating God from Christ. And because of that, there was a lot of confusion in the camp. And Paul comes in to set the record straight that the freedom that you now need to pursue can only come by way 
of Jesus Christ. I, I, I think that's so critical and important to, to make mention of because, um, you know, Myra did a great job in covering overall freedom and liberty, but we want to also understand that in a similar manner that was going on for the Galatians, I would argue that the same thing is going on with the body of believers today stuck in a tradition that was never meant to be something that we would ever uh, be in bondage to when Christ himself has said, you know, through him there is liberty and he who the Son has set free is free indeed. And he's the one who comes in and says, I'm removing the, the yoke of bondage and I'm taking that on for your sake. So when we're talking about this, the people in Galatia felt like they were under this yoke. And many of you today might feel similar, like, you know, this life, this life, it is such a burden, and, and it's heavy, and, and I'm not talking about physical heaviness, but it's just a heaviness, a heaviness of spirit. The atmosphere that's and the climate of this world today is not conducive for overall health, not spiritual health, nor physical health. And it's only when you allow those sins and weights that were so easily beset you to be released through Jesus Christ then and only then can you actually experience the liberty that I believe that uh, the Apostle Paul is talking about here. This is not just about, you know, things in the physical. This is about spiritual bondage. This is about understanding that that which is of the past is now gone. And behold, all things are become new and this was new guys and think about the folks in Galatia or Colossae or Corinth these are our pioneers they were going through all of the things that we don't have to deal with today I don't care how much persecution there is of the saints in our world this very day it could not possibly match what was going on in those days where there were so many different pagan beliefs, so many people that were still holding on to Judaism, and all of these things were contrary to what Jesus really came here to do. I heard Myra talk about it, you know, because we always look at this exchange between Christ and, and Peter, and we, we talk about it in a manner in which somehow Peter had something to do with things, but the foundation that was established was the fact that Christ himself is the solid rock. He's the foundation, and upon that foundation of Jesus Christ, we will build the ecclesia, the assembly. Notice, think about this, guys, when you really put it together. All of these books are dealing with people that had to scatter because they could not live in the same areas without persecution. And so you had uh, believers, newfound believers that were going all over the place, you know, just trying to be able to have some kind of fellowship that didn't cost them their lives. And we know in Scripture, every one of these apostles, except for John, were eventually... Uh, you know, murdered or slaughtered for the sake of the gospel that we could be here on February 11th, 2024 and talk about it ha, in the liberty that Christ has given us. So before I wrap it up, I told you I'm going to get this done. All right. So I want you to put focus on uh, verses two and three, because it says, look. I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man 
who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. And what Paul was trying to tell them is that if you're going to remain under the old covenant law, which again, we Gentiles were never part of, we came in by grace. If y'all learn that, it's so important that you would be under the bondage that many places of worship try to keep you in, trying to always keep you in a law that was never yours. Okay? So, but nevertheless, in this case, what was going on is, again, as I shared earlier, there were people that still felt this pressure in order to obey the old covenant and also embrace the new covenant, not understanding that Jesus came as the fulfillment of that old covenant. God put the old covenant in place to show man that there's no way he could be God. Because in order to be obedient to every one of those laws would mean you would have to be perfect, never without sin. And that is totally impossible for any human being that has ever been on this planet except for Jesus himself. And so... God understanding that he only put the law in place to teach man a lesson said, now I'm opening up the, 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 the portals here. I'm opening up the avenue. I'm making it possible, not just for my chosen of the Jewish persuasion, but now I'm grafting in all of you Gentiles, I don't care from what nation you are, now I'm also giving you the possibility to come and sup with me and that your cup may overflow, as it's talking about in Psalm 23. Now we can all be one ecclesia, one assembly, one church, not of a building, but of our spirit together to fellowship, not under a denomination, because that's bondage, not under any type of other foreign religious beliefs, that's bondage, but Christ. There is only one word, and I'm telling you the truth. Anybody that's talking about denominations, or I heard Myra talking about it earlier, talking about ordinations by man, you do not understand the liberty of Christ, because again, the Bible lets us know that we are ordained of him. We are called by him in order to do the work that he has assigned for us to do. We do not need someone else to come in and co-sign it. We do not need to have this so-called covering that is imperfect just as we are when we have the blood of Jesus that is the perfect covering and the only covering that we need in order to live a righteous and holy life. I'm going to jot down to verse 13 and read 13 through 15. It says there, For you were called to freedom, let me see, I can't even read my own thing. You were called to freedom. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are you are not consumed by one another. Hey, Jackie, I see you. Janae, I see you. This is so critical to understand because in one of you all, I'm talking to a church leader. Another, I'm talking to a faithful servant. Guys, love not only covers a multitude of sin, love is the only real commandment that we need to follow. The first commandment that Jesus came with is to love the Lord, your God, with all your might, soul, body, spirit, all, everything, all right? And the second is like unto the first, 
which is to love one another as ye uh, uh, have loved yourself. And this is the important thing. If you are spewing hate, you are not free. If you are angry and hostile, you are not free. You are still under the bondage. Look, people are not going to like you. Many will not like you for what you believe. Guarantee you that uh, in my life, there are many people that don't like the doctrine that I'm sharing with you guys now. They think I'm a vagabond because I'm not locked into a specific building. All of these things are there in order to hinder you, yet God says that in him there is liberty. And in Galatians, he's saying that liberty comes by way of loving one another. So I don't have any hate on anyone, even if they don't like me, because the greater example that we should be setting is that love can conquer all types of hate. Love is the one that can actually prick the hearts of those who are heavy. Love is the way that we show that we understand that God first loved us by us loving others. And when we do these things, then people will look at you and say, oh, there's something different about Myra. There's something different about Janae. There's something different about Angel. Because they see the love of Jesus in you, even though you're being persecuted, even though you're being spit upon, even though you are being hated. Love is the conquering mechanism that will give you the strength through the Holy Spirit to be able to overcome any type of anger. My God, my God. Lastly, for what I'm going to cover today, hey, Rusty, I see you. Um, these things come by way of the fruit of the Spirit. Now, we... Just, you know, we do not say fruits because there's only one fruit that has nine components, all right? And it's through that fruit, only through the Spirit. Because remember, when Jesus left us in the physical and he ascended into heaven to do what he said he's doing in John, where he's now preparing a place for us. You all know what I'm talking about. We're talking about the fact that Jesus had to fulfill his assignment that was away from this earth, but he promised that he would not leave us comfortless, but that he would bring one who would lead and guide us unto all truth, and that is the Holy Spirit. It's only by way of the Holy Spirit that we can address the issues of this current world. And what he tells us is 14, right? Yeah. John 14. So this is what he tells us not to do, and I'm going to take my seat, although I am sitting. Okay, he tells us when you activate the components of the fruit of the Spirit, then you can put aside idolatry, you can put aside sorcery, you can put aside all enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. We are no longer in bondage to those things. We have literally circumcised ourselves spiritually uh, in that we are no longer uh, uh, we are no longer of this world. We might be in it, but we're not of it. And that's a big, big difference. And that circumcision means you have to cut away the deeds of the flesh, all the things that I just said, and many more, all of these things, suicide, depression, anxiety, these things are not part of the Christian curriculum, and we ought to embrace those fruit, uh, the fruit, the fruit and the components that make that up, whether we're talking about love, joy, peace, you know, uh, goodness, kindness, uh, long-suffering, all of those things, that's what we embrace today. We put on gentleness. We put on self-control. We put on love and hope and faith. And when we do that, 
it literally will change the lives of people around us. And lastly, I'm going to just read verses 25 and 26. It says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Isn't it interesting how when we started out, we were already in freedom because Paul starts this letter in saying we're in freedom, and then he makes sure that we understand that in order to uh, remain in freedom that we must not be conceited and not provoke one another. He takes it on, not only spiritually, but he takes it to the natural. We have to be in this together, Rusty. We have to be in this together, Janae. We have to be in this together, Naomi, and anybody else who's out there. We need each other in order to show that the ecclesia, the church, the living, breathing church, is very much alive, not by televangelists, not by YouTubers, but by each and every one of us who, when we lock arms and hearts together, we prove that, that wonderful, wonderful Savior that we have in Christ. Amen.